Welcome back, everybody, here at Pausitorni and online. We have with us today Dr. Aaron Knochel from the Pennsylvania State University. He will speak to us about critical media education in the time of AI. Uh, after Dr. Knochel, we will hear a commentary remarks by Tommy Slotte Duva from Aalto University. Dr. Knochel, the floor is yours. There we go. Uh, can everybody hear me? Great. So uh, one of the things that happens when I uh, give a talk usually is I get excited. And when I get excited, I might talk a little fast. So if I start talking fast, just be like, slow down. Because <laughs> I know that all of you are working in many languages and English might not be your first language. Thank you very much for inviting me here today. Uh, I wanted to talk with you about some of the things that I've been learning about art artificial intelligence, uh, in particular, the kind of explosion of generative AI platforms. Um, and I wanted to start off by just doing a little informal survey. How many people have heard of Chat GPT? Can I just see every? Okay. How many people have used Chat GPT? Okay. Oh, pretty pretty much the same. And how many people have heard of uh, a platform like Midjourney, an image text to image platform? Okay, a little bit less. And how many people have actually used Midjourney? Okay. So it thin, thins out a little bit when we get to the text to image environment. Um, so. I, I wanted to start, I've been starting my talks around AI, trying to embed them in a longer conversation about the history of media, education, and creative practice. My space is in the visual arts. Um, I think of myself as an artist, an educator, and a technologist. And I'm always trying to be very cautious and aware of when we start to talk in hyperbole that this will change the world. So every time we, we get at a sort of really extreme rhetoric around this advancing innovation, I try to check myself and say, okay, where are we at? Have we seen this before? So uh, when I was a child, I'm going to date myself here a little bit, I remember watching MTV coming on air and really not understanding what cable television was. It was a sort of radical new space which proliferated a whole bunch of different TV stations, which as a kid, I was thrilled, right? And one of the, the very first song that was played on MTV um, was a song called Video Killed the Radio Star by The Buggles. It's a catchy tune, you should check it out, it's on YouTube. But essentially, it was sort of this tongue-in-cheek gesture of a video music platform, cable television station, announcing the death of radio, right? Well, I don't know if you, you've turned on the radio lately, it's still there, right? In, if any case, radio and audio narratives have proliferated. We now have streaming, podcasts, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things that I've learned in my, my years of being in this space of education, media, and creative practice, is that media tends to proliferate right? The ecosystem grows. Now, resources tend to congregate towards different locations. So certainly, broadcast radio has slimmed, right? That used to be the dominant sort of form of, of how radio was, was enjoyed and listened to. And we've got other models now that use digital systems and uh, streaming and internet you know, capabilities. But radio didn't go anywhere. Right? I mean, and we could look at a number of different media artifacts and innovations over the last 50 years and suggest that this ecosystem continues to grow. So, in about six months ago, uh, when I first ran into really using Midjourney for the first time, which for those of you who are unfamiliar, Midjourney is a text-to-image AI generative platform. So you type in a, a sentence, you know, um, alien with blue hair, right? And the um, environment will spit out an image. Mid -journey, the mid-journey um, platform will spit out an image, or actually four images, which you then can choose from. That was really my first interaction with, an with a text-to-image AI platform. And as an educator and a researcher in this space, the thing that's unique about mid-journey that really caught my attention is that it's actually hosted on a messaging app called Discord. How many people are familiar with Discord? 
all the kids love the Discord. I mean, to me, it's another AOL Messenger, right? It's just, it's just the same thing repackaged with a different name. But for some reason, Discord is the, is the message board of the day. Um, my, I went on Discord because my students asked me to meet them there, right? They said, hey, we're all on Discord. Join us there, right? So I did. I, you know, I try to stay with it a little bit. Um, but the fascinating thing about, about MidJourney as a text-to-image to environment is that you are act actively participating in a community of people who are prompting the Discord bot and generating images. So you're actually making images in a community of online users. And this, to me, got me really excited. Because again, I'm, an, I'm an arts education researcher. I'm very interested in how people um, have creative practices, but I'm also very interested in how they learn from one another, how they develop those practices. And here, Discord offered this wonderful sort of view of what an AI generative platform might look like in a group setting, right? How people are learning from one another. Debates over how to you know, develop the kind of right sentence to get the right kind of image and how to use the mid-journey bot to your advantage, right? So as a research space, I found it very interesting. But you can see the, you know, the growth. I mean, mid-journey is a baby, right? It's really, really young. It's had five iterations, but you can see its uptake has been quite new, right? You've got a spike here. This is when it first sort of came online a little bit more. This is when it really started to take off, right? And a lot of that had to do with different iterations, uh, its growth in sort of photorealistic kinds of images. It's also aligning with different kinds of anime or Japanese animation images, uh, which has been really strategic in Midjourney's growth. But for me, mid-journey is, again, think about where I started, trying to think about the ecosystem of media education and the growth, right? And how certainly things don't die out or replace, but they expand. My work over the years has really been focused in graphic design software. And so areas like Photoshop, right? Or I should say software like Photoshop, software like Illustrator, seeing my students grow and expand their visual language using software environments. And to me, I thought, how does Midjourney, or AI generative platforms like Midjourney, how does it extend my work in, in visual technologies such as Photoshop software, right? Now, this might seem like an unusual connection, right? Like, have you heard anybody say like, well, what about, what about Photoshop, right? <laughs> but for me, Midjourney, while it introduces some dramatically new and interesting spaces for creation, it's an extension of an already existing space that lots of people are involved with. Now, Photoshop and Adobe and, and programs like that tend to be a little bit more niche and focused on creative communities. But to me, I want to sort of situate how I connect AI platforms within a longer sort of history of what it means to create images using computers. So one of the terms I've started to use is this idea of um, Synthography, and I, I didn't invent this term. I, I, I grabbed it from somebody else who did, like a good scholar, right? Giving them, of course, reference. Uh, but the idea of synthography is basically image making in a kind of synthesis, a bringing together, right? But what I like to think about synthography is that, you know, Hannah Hock from 1920 was a synthographer. So even early 20th century forms of collage from popular media types like magazines and newspapers, which was, this was radically avant-garde at that time, right? That to me is a part of a lineage of synthography, right? Because it's using media systems, it's remixing, it's bringing things together, and it's putting out images that become a synthesis, right? A graphic synthesis. And we can make an argument, or at least I'd like to think we can, that AI platforms are doing something similar only dramatically larger. They're drawing from a dramatically larger pool of resources, right? So this is an image that I generated in Midjourney um, that was essentially make me, make me an interface of um, Midjourney as if it was Photoshop, right? So that's, that's Midjourney's self-portrait, essentially, as Photoshop, I guess. So my work in thinking about visual technologies, I often rely and use um, a scholar by the name of Bruno Latour, uh, who was a French scholar, and uh, he, he was a part of an area of theory called actor network theory. And he had this sort of suggestion that when you want to try and make sense of new technologies and the ways that they're impacting society, try and take four different perspectives. Try and take four different perspectives. Because these perspectives will sometimes yield insight, right? 
They will give you a kind of pers- a perspective or a knowledge about how we might think of the cultural implications of these technologies. One is to think about innovation, how we define innovation, where it comes from, when everybody's calling it innovation, right? That's another important thing. Uh, distance, this is, I, this is I, that idea of sort of getting some critical distance from something, trying to find a different angle to look at it. I would suggest that my, my desire to see mid-journey as connected with a longer history of visual technologies is a way of creating distance because I'm trying to situate it in a way that can allow me to analyze it, right? Um, accidents, so finding ways that, that sort of these technologies uh, don't work, how they don't function, right? Dysfunction creates meaning. And then finally, dis- doc- documents or the larger space of how uh, these technologies are being engaged. And so for me, this is a visualization of some images, again, focusing on Photoshop and thinking about how users are using Photoshop, right? So this is me trying to sort of do some web scraping to say, yes, Photoshop is a program where you can do anything, quote unquote, but what are people doing? If we look at what's actually being produced, what does that tell us about what Photoshop does, not what it can do? And there's a, there's, a, there's a dramatic difference there. So what's AI, right? Um, if you want to get a good laugh, just Google has this wonderful thing where it sort of broadcasts like what the very first top one, AI, Will Smith eating spaghetti. Apparently, this is a very popular prompt. I have no idea why. Uh, I just check Twitter. I'm sure it's on the, the memes, right? But I mean, look at this. Take jobs. Kill us. Replace jobs, change the world, change the world, end the world, replace the programmer, right? This is pretty bleak or wonderful stuff. So AI is scary, right? I think it's scary. Anybody familiar with this one? This is uh, Loab, I think that's how you say it, which was purportedly a a sort of haunting of of the AI systems. This was uh, perpetuated through a tweet around different AI image generation platforms where apparently this visage of a, of a sort of creepy zombie-like woman was showing up in unexplained ways, right? So this sort of scary, the, the haunting of the machine here, right? That AI is this kind of scary, unknown haunting. But it's all not just imaginary, right? I mean, there's lots to be worried about. Uh, certainly the loss of jobs, automation. Um, the end of truth. Right? This idea of deep fakes, the, the idea that we will not be able to discern authentic communication. And then, of course, in our space in education, the sort of en- unending sort of tropes around the end of education. Right? But notice there's also like, and this is what I love about educators, right? There are glimmers of hopes through all these, right? Educators are hopeful people. Um, so that even though AI presents many challenges, there's also many things that we can do with it. Right? and many things that we can use it for to increase the success and opportunities of our students. And of course, there's also the, the, the very, I think, speculative but possibly real threat of human extinction, right? There are some extreme diagnoses about the end game, um, which we've seen in science, fi- science fiction, and some arguments out there of people who are really pushing what this might mean. Um, I want to clarify that my discussion today, and I think most of what we're dealing with in today's society in terms of AI, should be distinguished from a a deeper conversation about artificial general intelligence. And this is the the idea of general intelligence is the one that becomes autonomous and sort of derives its own ways of being in the world and will probably get rid of us, right? But we're we're nowhere near, at least in my opinion, AGI right now. Um, although I think it's appropriate to speculate because I don't think it's that far on the horizon if we're not taking appropriate steps. So uh, there's a couple of folks in this space who are you know, doing some very interesting thinking uh, around this. Uh, the the um, Center for Humane Technology, uh, Tristan Harris and um, Azar Raskin gave a really good talk around the dilemma of AI. And I, what I love about their perspective is that they suggest, you know, we've already had an encounter with AI. It was social media. See how well that went, (laughs) right? I mean, they're saying is that social media was a grand experiment using very simple metrics of AI. In other words, you know, what feeds you see and how it prioritizes um, uh, posts and things of that nature. And there's been dramatic impacts of a really negative effect with social media. Had lots of promise, but the the, uh, many of the outcomes have had dramatic impacts on our democracy, on our on our health, right, on our well-being. And so they're, they're asking us to pause and think about, you know, they're making comparisons to the rise of nuclear weapons. 
And the difference being that nukes can't create nukes. But AI, as a platform, can create AI. And so when we don't understand what that means, we need to pause. These are people who are advocating for pause. Another um, person who's advocating for pause is uh, Yuval Noah Harari, a really uh, wonderful speaker, historian, uh, and philosopher. And his, his talk, is, his, his perspective is really this idea of, you know, it's not going to be the Terminator, mon the robot that's gonna come get, come, going to come get us. It's going to be AI's ability to master intimate interactions so that it'll be us, right? The danger is that AI can be released or unleashed in a way that makes convincing um, intimate relationships to, prevent, to convince people to do un unimaginable things, right? I think this is a very real threat. I, I really agree with him here, right? That this is a space that we, it's, it's, not, it's not the titanium beast that we should be concerned with. It's the, the role of sort of how these AI systems can, can formulate relationships and bend, bend people's sort of understanding of situations and create sort of will, false will, I would call it. Right? We have to be concerned about that. I mean, this is like propaganda to the trillionth effect, right? That's where we need to be concerned. Uh, I also like N. N. Catherine Hales, uh, who talks about this idea of thinking of these technological agents that, you know, AI and other machines that do things that we find so incredible, it's not so much they, that they have consciousness, but they do cognate, right? We can consider what they do cognition, but not consciousness. And so we are involved in a relationship. She calls them cognitive assemblages, these groups of human and non-human things that interact together to create complex thinking systems. And to me, this is a really, I think, a very smart insight, right? That I'm, I don't want to jump into the debate of consciousness, but I want to acknowledge that AI does cognate, and it affects how we think as well. and affects how we think with it. Those are all very real things that are happening right now. So the debate around consciousness, fine, we can have that. It's, of course, significant, but unclear. But I think the idea of cognition is, is simple and clear, right? We can consider AI to, be, to have cognitive action, right? And that we participate in those, those actions with it. So as a consciousless cognizer, AI will change work. It will change media, and it will change education, all right? So how do we become critically literate? And I want to be very careful, or point out, that I'm trying to be very careful about how I'm asking this question. First of all, become. It's a, it's a process that never stops, right? Because in my mind, the idea of critical literacy, and we could stick media in there, right? That literacy is achieved by an understanding of an evolving cultural space. And so if it's evolving, we're always evolving with it. You don't just learn it and you're done, over, right? Especially in media spaces because the media itself evolves. So we have to keep our game up, especially in media spaces, as media educators. So this idea of how do we become critically literate is the job of our students and our job, right? It's our work together. It's a relational work. So when I was a kid and they talked about literacy, they always mentioned reading, writing, and arithmetic, right? So in a sense, when I talk about literacy, I try to keep myself grounded by saying, what am I talking about, right? What am I talking about? What does it mean to be media literate or critically literate? So if I was to, and I'm, I'm using these a bit as metaphors right here, right? So what does it mean to read as a critically literate person in the time of AI? Um, acts of reflexive interpretation, bringing yourself into modes and expression and interpretation. Value of embodied knowing, AI doesn't have a body. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> I would venture to say that it, it will not have a body ever. Not like our bodies. That doesn't, that, I'm not saying that it can't have a biological system. I'm saying it cannot have a body like ours. Right? That's a unique asset that we should remember. Remain fluid and ethical. <laughs> Sometimes those seem like opposing ideas, but again, in the, in the evolution of this cultural space, we need to be fluid to new impacts right? and changing dynamics. And then presuppose cognitive assemblages. <laughs> Notice that this is a part of all of them. You just have to live in a world where you know 
that you're working with machine systems. There's no, there's no getting outside of the system at this point, right? Uh, the writing is about performing and creative practice, human sharing. And the arithmetic part, I tried to think about ways that we could begin to incorporate computational awareness because I, I really think that this is going to be fundamental to no matter what media we're paying attention to, we have to be aware that of the way that computational and network systems impact, implement, and deliver those media types and those media experiences. And then algorithmic counter logics, this is my uh, basically skepticism, but it's skepticism about how algorithms form our way of knowing the world. I'm never going to make it through my slides, so I'm going to move quick. You'll have these slides, I promise. I'm going to make sure that you get a hold of them, but I'm, I'm already running a little short on time. So what is generative AI? Um, it's a machine learning process. It's a, it's a way that neural networks, and a neural network is just simply an, an architecture for computers and, and program systems to pass information back and forth. And when I say pass information, like we could pass a note around the room you know, and then in 100 million years, we would achieve what a computer system is able to do in a day, right? That's, that's, the, that's the level that we're talking about here, right? We're talking about billions of data points, trillions of metrics, right? Like we just, we, we cannot comprehend the, the scope and size of these. Um, what's driving much of the, the AI pla generative platforms is this idea of a large language model. So at some fundamental way, even if you are, you know, text to sound, let's say you're creating music with AI systems, that text to X environment is using a translation that's based upon language. This is essentially the dominant paradigm that we're in right now. And th there, there will be many, many others. This is just what's ca capturing our attention right now. Chat GPT, Dolly 2, uh, GPT-4, all, all of them, all of it. It's pretty much text to X paradigm. Text to image, text to sound, text to whatever, right? They're even doing text to 3D models now which I find really fascinating. So some things that we should be worried about in terms of language, uh, the training is biased towards English. And while translation, well, you might think, well, you can just translate, right? But no, there, there are sort of narratives, there are cultural patterns and logics that are embedded in language, that are embedded the way, in the ways that syntax is used, right? that can't be just translated away. Right? And so when those, again, it's okay one or twice or three or four times, but when you're downloading the, you know, the entire internet, so to speak, you can't eradicate the kinds of cultural frameworks that are also a part of that download. And so we have a sort of inherent bias of that overly dominant English data set. I ran into this issue when I was prompting, I was doing this project where I was playing with Midjourney to see what kinds of artist reproductions I could, because one of the issues is around copyright and artist work. And there's this artist by the name of Lawrence Wiener. And in the United States, if you're in elementary school and you say the word wiener, you, you snicker because it's a, you know, a, a sort of funny gesture and refers to male genitalia and can be a joke, right? Well, Midjourney has words that just cannot be used. You, they're just off the list. You just can't use them, right? And many of them are overtly bad. But wiener surprised me. So I could not do any work or, or works around the, the artist Lawrence Wiener, right? So this is where that language thing gets sort of tripped up and sort of becomes absurd, right? But it's not always absurd. You can also run into a lot of, um, a lot of issues around just scientific biological terms in, in reference to the female body that are policed or outlawed or grotesque in a way that's, that's sort of hard to imagine, right? Like the system can, can spit out highly photorealistic images, so why is a, a, a gynecological exam coming out in this way, right? So language prompts are not an engineering science. As soon as somebody says, you know, prompt engineering, that seems to be the, the way that they're referring to it, which is just ludicrous. Um, it's not an engineering science. It's an interface, right? The language is an interface to this unknowable black box, which is the language model, right? And so, the, at, and again, involving these trillions of metrics. And that's, that is the reality, is that even the computer sciences don't know what's happening. You can ask the, the forefront researchers, and they're saying, well, I don't know, we put one, one, this in one end, it comes out the other end? It's amazing, isn't it? Surprises us too. Right. So we talk about data. 
um, again, these large language models and, and the foundation of machine learning, you need a data set. And the bigger your data set, the better training that you can, you can enable and the more effective your, your model might be in, in achieving some said goal. But data sets are taken from the internet. You're going to see this. The internet is the material of AI right now. These generative AI platforms would not exist without our you know, 20, 20, 25 year uh, investment in the internet, right? All those blogs, who knew? Who knew all those blogs, right? Who knew Reddit would be a, a part of this? Um, early training was kind of a wild harvest. They just kind of went and took, because there was no precedent. So they just went and, and vacuumed it all up, right? And of course, now there's this massive, massive eruption of ethical issues around privacy and copyright. It kind of reminds me of the browser wars in the 90s. Anybody remember that? Remember Netscape? Yes. When Microsoft stole basically Netscape and they said, oh, I'm sorry, here's some money. We just made a billion dollars. We're just going to keep moving. There's no more Netscape. That's what OpenAI will just continue to truck along. I'm sure they're going to pay a lot of money with this stuff. Dolly 2, Midjourney, they'll all, they're all pay because they'll be fined. But they've already made their money, right? I don't mean to be so cynical, but you know, it is a little cynical. It is. It absolutely is. So we're right now, what's, what's fascinating now is we're, we are in the moment of this legislation, right? So in the US and EU are taking very different tacks on this. One of the interesting things in the States is the kind of story, the narrative of the artist defending their work. And don't forget, you know, Getty Images is also at the table saying, hey, wait, you're using our images too. We already stole those images, right? Um, in March 2023, just, just last month, or two months ago, I guess, uh, the US Copyright Office determined that you know, AI images cannot be copyrighted. So it's like a step forward, maybe a step back, though, because now it's hard to evaluate their commercial value, which makes artist claims in copyright lawsuits hard to understand or determine. Right? So you know, mixed, a mixed bag there. The EU on May 11th, what is this, like last week, they just put out the EU uh, Artificial Intelligence Act, and this is seismic impact right here. So this means anybody coming to the table has to divulge the copyrighted information. This means you probably won't get open AI here. <laughs> They'll probably pull back, right? Or mid-journey. Because they won't be able to meet this standard. Uh, that's my guess, at least, right? Or they'll risk being sued and just pay the fines, which they do all the time. Facebook just got fined $1.3 billion. So there's another thing when we think about data. On top of that is this idea of algorithm bias. So data sets, again, are largely from the internet, internet, which replicates the bias that we see online. And computation as a field itself, there's sort of two angles to this, this idea of bias, right? That not only is the data biased, but also computation, uh, computer science itself has been overly dominant by white cisgender males, right? This sort of one way of sort of approaching the world culturally and, and th through a sort of gendered gaze, right? Um, so there's a really great report, Bias and Algorithms, uh, that came out uh, by the European Union Agency looking uh, to how do we address algorithm bias. And it gives you know, these sort of four areas of thinking about oversight, uh, increasing language diversity, looking for uh, bias in speech detection and prediction models, and then this idea of the runaway feedback loops. They're, they're theorizing that early in the training, certain metrics can be out of whack, and if you don't catch them early on, the feedback loop that is the training will exacerbate that. So look at all this good stuff. Climate crisis, I have one minute left. There's too much to talk about. But this is the, this is, I wanted to come back to this slide because this is the most important thing here. Because AI is a bodiless, suspicious, computational, flawed, expansive, and limited brainstorming partner, which can be really, really impactful to your work. So do we halt? Do we jump off the ship? Do we pull it over? Or do we stay calm and carry on? Um, these are just some of the suggestions that, I, that I'd like to think might help to steer or guide, right? So thinking about training regulations, protecting the little creator, looking at copyright laws that I think are invested in innovation and not ownership. Um, thinking about over open governance, not just open source, right? So it's one thing to open source the code, but what about open governance of AI? Right? Um, higher standards on tech release. I mean, you know, biomedical companies don't just release things and say, okay, let's see how it goes. Right? Why, why isn't tech at, at this level being also up to those same standards? 
broadening diversity in the AI research community, and then baking in sustainability from the ground level. We're already not at the ground level, but we still have a chance to do that, to make demands upon how cloud service, like how these um, AI systems are generating uh, reusable energy, or at least zero emission, right? But of course, get ready, because it's all about to change. Next week, half of what I just said will be different. Kitos. So we do have a, um, a commentary from Tommy, my friend and colleague. Are you going to introduce him or should I? I'll just do it. Tommy, why don't you come on up here? Um, and then we'll have, uh, I think, a little bit of time for, for comments. So can you turn this off? Or? Yeah. yeah, thank you, thank you, Aaron, for the talk and uh, uh, lots of significant and interesting points. I feel sort of exhausted already and I haven't even talked anything. So let's see how this goes. But I try to make it brief so we can have some, some questions and so on. So I just want to sort of uh, touch on the few things that Aaron, you already actually touched. and. Uh, and moreover, instead of sort of a discussing a particular technology or, or sort of a software of AI, I want to focus on, focus on the whole entanglement of AI, the sort of a computational awareness maybe that, uh, that when I think about media education, I think that my, my thoughts go into this kind of a different st strands of critical pedagogy and uh, new literacy movement and, and, and later to this kind of a feminist pedagogies and post-colonial and more than human uh, theories. And um, this might of course be sort of a, my own strange quirky way of thinking, but uh, I think naturality media education has this kind of a wider narratives and, and a backgrounds that we should also uh, sort of implement in, 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 in when we think, think about AI and uh, and what I think what is, what is essential in this kind of a critical pedagogy background is the sort of uh, to to inspect the whole spectrum of the media of the AI from it, from its from its technology to its sort of a social cultural politic and economic entanglements and and when talking about AI uh, it's then in, in in this context crucial to look at the whole assemblage of AI and how it's tied into these different strands of politics, cultures, markets, uh, climate change, climate crisis, and so on. And it, looking at it from this point, it's, it makes me quite sort of anxious, at, at least in some points. I'm not still losing sleep, and I'm not still losing sleep for any gener sort of a general artificial intelligence for, I, I don't think we are, we are not there, at least yet. But for instance, the things that uh, was mentioned already, the sort of a homogeneous origins of AI, uh, the biases in data collection and analy analysis, the underpaid and hidden work that's laid I sort of uh, inside these kind of uh, large language models, all the other ethical issues uh, and all the ecological issues, which are uh, quite huge. There, there's not that much research on them, but uh, what, what, what there has been, it's quite sort of alarming. Uh, moreover, and instead of AI, I think we should probably be talking about massing learning and large data models, but I think that's a fight we have already lost. We talk about AI, even though it's, it's nothing like uh, sort of a Skynet kind of overlords or matrix kinds of visions of spiders and human batteries or hacking the matrix or something like that. We, we are not there, but it's, it's included in the, in the, in the sort of uh, discussion of AI when we talk about AI. And I, that's a sort of a, maybe sort of a thing we could, we could all also focus on that, that what are we actually talking about when we talk about AI. Uh, all this is not to say that AI as, as we have it now could not be useful or could, would not be highly significant, but the rather that we should be voicing our concerns on how the AI is fabricated, developed and spread currently. 
Uh, Kate Crawford, uh, who, who is a researcher and author, writes in her book at Atlas of AI that in contrast, I argue that AI is neither artificial nor intelligent. Rather, artificial intelligence is both embodied and material, made from natural resources, fuel, human labor, infrastructures, logistics, histories, and classifications. AI systems are not autonomous, rational, or able to discern anything without extensive computational intensive training with large data sets or predefined rules and rewards. In fact, artificial intel intelligence, as we know it, depends entirely on a much wider set of political and social structures, and due to the capital required to build AI at scale and the ways of seeing that it optimizes AI systems are ultimately designed to serve existing dominant interests. interests. Crawford ends that in this sense, artificial intelligence is a registry of power. Besides these issues that actually resemble a lot like the issues of critical pedagogy in the time of mass media or, or this kind of the thing that we are in, in this sense, we are not in, in front of something new. This is just another uh, sort of a wave of uh, technology or, or sort of media striking through us. Uh, but besides these issues, there is a lot of sort of a uh, problems with the, with the large models. Uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding and hype up about what they are or what they are able to do. In short, what the large, large, large language or other models, they are mostly language models right now, are good is, is at saying what an answer should sound like, which is different from what an answer should be. And this aspect of fooling or deceiving is in many ways at the center of the AI discussions and has, has always been from the Turing test to other intelligence tests as we try to make this kind of a machines that can imitate human thought. Uh, James Bridle in his book, Ways of Being, critiques this human ten tendency to value only intelligence similar to ours and asks what, what would happen if we would widen our thinking into this kind of a more than human world and value other intelligences and other ways of knowing. What would be the sort of AI we create then and how should we use it in, in that kind of sort of a context? Last. I want to touch the process of generating with AI. And here I think there are lots of interesting possibilities, uh, but only if we are willing to step a bit further from just uh, clicking something, the, 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 the sort of a form of text to something, to just writing funny prompts and clicking a button. Uh, I said this because I think that the most of the meaningful things we experience or create attachment to or create meaning to takes some effort. And as I've been following the discussions around AI generators, often the benefits are along the line of AI is effortless. It's easy, it's fast, it's cost effective and so on. But what I'm saying is that in, 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 order to, in order to get interesting results of AI, it, it requires some sweating. It requires some thinking, some time, some time to reflect and experience the AI. So if we do this, I think these generators might offer us new insights into who we are, about life, and so on. In other words, the AI generators can be artistic tools. They can be tools for thinking and expressing, but such things just can't be generated. They come through this kind of time-demanding processes. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting artists doing this kind of things. And to conclude, I, I want to remind Still, that by using these popular AI generators, however easy and sort of supposedly harmless they appear to us, it is still, time, it is still at the same time taking part in the highly wasteful and unethical processes. And we must focus on these aspects to, fi to find better ways of implement and distribute AI technologies. 
And there's a lot of job for media education. Thank you.